Coming to you from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, by way of Stone Mountain, Georgia, birthed by the great state of South Carolina, is the Bryant Land Country Podcast, your place for any and everything in hunting, fishing, sports, and outdoor related, with heavy doses of randomness, guests, and an all-around good time. Here's your host, proud Gamecock, South Carolina Forever, AB3. All right, now everybody come on in and have a sit down. Welcome to the Bryant Land Country Podcast. I am your host, AB3, coming in to you from Indianapolis, Indiana, getting ready to do one more game before the All-Star break. When this drops next Monday, I will be back on the land doing some work down uh, in Georgia in the middle of the all-star break but as of right now this very second as i'm laying down this introduction i am on the last game before the nba all-star break i'm excited I'm ready for a little break here uh, ready to recharge batteries and then finish out the season so i'm um, looking forward to it cannot wait to get that over with tonight and then get on down home see the kids do some things with them do some work on the property all that kind of stuff there but before i do all that got a couple things i want to knock out before i get into the guest this week now you've heard me talk about feedback and about doing emails and sending you know feedback and questions and stuff so i got two pieces of uh feedback and a question that i want to share with you guys um that was sent in by listeners of course i appreciate that and encourage more of you to do the same uh the first piece of feedback i got is from a fella named brandon sent me a uh direct message on facebook i really appreciate it sent me a message and i'm going to read like i said these comments and messages and uh answer a couple of his questions uh first comment really loving the new podcast and the diverse voices makes me feel closer to having a community in this very white male dominated space even though our ancestors show them how it's done we continue to show them how it's done we love to hear about your hunting setups favorite calibers favorite hunts maybe even some hot tips either for hunting or cooking wild game i've started taking some other people out on local hunts here in california and don't have a teacher or mentor at all so we're just winging it started an instagram to bring awareness and access to folks who may not have an opportunity to go on a hunt instagram is at decolonized meat eater brandon Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your feedback, man. I appreciate it. Glad you're listening to the podcast. Glad you're getting other folks out there to get them into this hunting thing and bringing awareness to them, getting some access to folks out there. I believe uh, California, yep, California is where he said he was from. I've never hunted out in California. It's definitely on one of my to-do lists. It's on a place that I want to go. But to your question, probably uh, as far as hunting setups, I majority hunt uh, with a bow. Uh, it is a Matthews bow triax. Um, that's what I like to shoot. Got some arrows. I started shooting. Um, well, I'm going to start shooting Black Eagle arrows coming up here. I had been shooting Carbon Express for a while. Really love those. Really don't like to tinker or change too much. But um, I had a guy um, spin some arrows for me. Did a great job with putting, you know, those uh, arrows together. DCA Custom Arrows, fellow out of Indiana, I believe. DCA Custom Arrows put the uh, some arrows together for me. So I'm going to start uh, fooling around with the Black Eagle Arrows. Swacker Broadhead has always been my broadhead of choice. Um, and usually with that combination, I've put down, you know, quite a few deer, a couple hogs. And then I put down my first turkey, which is also probably my favorite hunt so far. Been my uh turkey hunt as far as like cooking wild game uh my crock pot a lot of stuff in the next few weeks i'll go through a couple of things um you know my crock pot recipes and little tips and things that i do uh with my deer meat and, and uh some wild hogs so uh brandon once again thank you for the message thank you for uh sending in some feedback greatly appreciate it keep listening to the podcast and uh make sure you uh, tell five people about this old podcast we're putting together here now another comment that i got is from I'm not sure if i'm going to pronounce this right but it's m-a-s-w-g-m mazel i i don't know but 
It was a comment from episode five, which uh, was my conversation with Jordan Summit from Buck Commander. It says, interesting to hear Jordan's original major was graphic design. I majored in that too and will do some graphic design and do some graphic design now myself. I am friends with Jordan on Facebook. I am thrilled to hear him mention taking his son's hunting. He's the best father his sons could possibly have. I'm from South Carolina. Jordan is one heck of a hunter and cameraman. So there you go. Guy's a big fan of you, Jordan. Uh, um, and what you do with Buck Commander. Thank you for listening to the Bryant Land Country podcast. And anytime a fellow South Carolinian wants to, you know, get at me or send me a message, send me some feedback, you know, I'm always for it. Very proud to be from the state of South Carolina myself. So those are the two uh, feedback and uh, questions that I've gotten uh, here that I wanted to read and pass along to you guys. Like I said, feel free to send me an email, send me an inbox, uh, make some comments, you know, ratings and whatnot. We'll definitely get to them here on the podcast. I've enjoyed doing this podcast so far, and it lets me know when I get feedback from you guys that I'm doing something right. So um continue please to send me those uh emails and uh feedback and things like that as for the guest on this episode fella i reached out to here a little bit ago because i was checking out his instagram he took a church an old church building and he renovated it himself he took the time to make all the repairs do all the things that he needed to do to the church and basically turned it into a hunting camp down in Arkansas. And he calls it Black Duck Revival. The fellow name is Jonathan Wilkins. I had a chance to talk to Jonathan over Super Bowl weekend. I really enjoyed it. Things that he's doing down there in Arkansas, you know, not only with restoring the church, but bringing people in to hunting and also using the turned around church, using that space to be a place where people can come together, talk hunting, meet, you know, new people and just experience the wild down there in Arkansas. I have ran my mouth enough here on this introduction. I'm going to sit back. You guys kick back. Listen to my conversation with Jonathan Wilkins from Black Duck Revival. Jonathan, what's going on, man? Thanks for taking the time to come through and talk to me. How are you? Man, I'm doing well. Uh, how about yourself? I cannot complain. Finally got into my room here in the uh, big fancy town of New York City. I'm going to have a conversation with you here for a little bit and then probably get down and try to find somewhere to watch the Super Bowl before we have to go back to work tomorrow. Right on. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Now, I have obviously have done a good bit of research, and you reached out to me, and I just want to say thank you, first of all, for reaching out to me. That was a unexpected uh, message that I got from you, but it's always welcome because it kind of lets me know that you know we are headed in the right direction with what we're trying to do with the brand and with Bryantland and stuff. So I, first of all, like I want to say I appreciate you know reaching out to me. Oh, no, absolutely, man. I'll tell you, I was just sitting there, you know, peeling through Instagram or whatever, and I said, man, uh, this is a black guy with a duck. I want to holler at him and say, what's up? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And sometimes it's just as simple as that. That's what makes it so cool. Like, it, it's just as simple as like, whoa, wait a minute. That's not something you see every day just yet. Well, what's going on here? So, no, nah, I, yeah, I mean, I never, I never see it. So when it, if I do see it, you know, I take note for sure. It, it piques my interest. And then, and it's funny because it led me to go and check out your stuff and you have dedicated, you know, your mission to you've built a lodge and you've got like a really good thing going with the lodge built out of um built out of an old church but before i get into all that let's backtrack now one of the things that i saw you said you started hunting nine years ago what brought you in to hunting and what made you wanted to do it and and getting started i guess quote unquote late yeah sure later in life uh yeah man so i grew up in st louis missouri and you know, no one in my family hunted uh actually i'm my parents are both, or you know, fairly staunch. Had a fairly staunch stance on you know not having guns in the house or anything. And um, I ended up going to Arkansas to attend a small liberal arts college. And then you know just through the path of meandering about in life, I uh, I met a girl from Arkansas, and I mean we've been together for 13 years now. But eventually we ended up just kind of out of necessity. We moved uh, onto a, like an abandoned single wide trailer that was out on 15 acres of her family's land. And uh, the buddy of mine that I was working with, we had a little business uh, building decks and 
fences and stuff like that. He was a big time bow hunter and he was just stoked about having access to all these woods because the 15 acres backed up to about a thousand acres of a uh, hardwood forest. And he kind of started just dragging me along, wanting to look for gear sign or, you know, take a look at how big these acorn trees are, this, that, and the other. He got me into bow hunting. I was really lucky and very quickly I had some success bow hunting. I kind of took to it. That developed into, you know, hunting other stuff. Like pretty much now I hunt squirrels, I hunt ducks, and I uh, hunt deer. And that's kind of what I've been focusing on for the last five years or so. But, you know, still new stuff I want to check out. I want to try turkey hunting this year. And Arkansas is not a great state for turkey hunting, but uh, there's definitely opportunities for it. So, yeah, just started doing it and realized that I kind of had a little bit of a knack for it. That also it was it was filling a void in my life that I don't think I realized that I had uh, as far as being in the outdoors and experiencing it on a very personal level and being able to kind of combine thoughtfulness and physicality and hanging out with your friends and all that kind of stuff. And it pretty quickly took over my life and is now the, the focal point of it, I guess. Right. And see, that's the thing, like, with bow hunting because bow hunting was my introduction into hunting because you know like i did a little bit of fishing and stuff growing up you know fishing with cousins and whatnot you know my dad didn't really do a lot of like outdoorsy stuff as far as like fishing and hunting man when i picked up a bow a few years ago it was just like it it melted in my hands and the crazy thing is you know i'm pretty much right-handed with everything that i do you know I'm i'm a righty but when i went in and i got fitted for a bow and i I couldn't close, you know, like they, you know, like you close your eye for like the people, whatever. And it was like, either you can wear a patch or you can switch. So I was like a switch and it was just as easy and natural switch to start shooting left-handed. But it, it's one of those things when once you get started and you, you know, you really get into it and you start working at it, man, it becomes an addiction. Yeah. I mean, it, it requires, bow hunting requires time and effort in ways that other other methods of, you know, hunting a deer or big game don't. I'd say specifically white-tailed deer because uh, that's probably what most people are bow hunting for. But, you know, I've even read stuff and it made a lot of sense to me that, you know, you can really overthink bow hunting and aiming and trying to shoot. And obviously, you know, I've, I'm have like most people, I've killed most stuff with a compound bow, but yeah. I've really taken an interest in using some more traditional tactics, uh, using like a recurve bow. And when you start shooting that, it seems so intimidating because you don't have a peep and you don't have a sight. But, you know, if you think about it, when you were a kid, no one had to teach you how to play catch with somebody. You know, you instinctually could take that ball and use your eyes and your experience and judge a distance and figure out where you're trying to put that ball and put it pretty close to it. And you can kind of do the same thing shooting traditional tackle. To me, that that's even another level of it because you have to get kind of so in tune with yourself and your abilities and the outside world. And also, you know, I mean, shooting a compound bow is not, in my estimation, it's not difficult. You know, like <laughs> I bought a compound and two, two weeks later, you know, I had a wall hanger. Wow. Uh, now there was a lot of luck and it was the rut and all that kind of stuff. But, and there were some, there was definitely some things that I did right in it, but you know, people get into that crossbow debate and the compound debate right. and all that. And the baddest dudes that I know that bow hunt, like I know a guy that, uh, he naps his own arrowheads, like out of Coke bottles, like old Coke bottle glass and makes his own, makes his own bows. That's on a level that's not comparable to compound hunting at all, you know? Yeah. And it's funny because I just talked to a fella, um, actually from that St. Louis area a few weeks ago, guy by the name of Christopher, and he does, uh, like his own, like bow. He makes his bow out of like his own wood and then he, you know, uses the, uh, hides and stuff for strings and then he makes his own broadheads and stuff. And like you said, that's, that's next level for me. I think that was the other reason why too I took to bow hunting so easily and so quickly is because, like you said, you pick up a compound bow, you shoot it it a few times and then you get like a feel and you start getting reps for it it doesn't take long and i'm like you like my first kill was maybe like a few months after mine was a few months because i didn't have an opportunity to go hunting i went on a hog hunt maybe like four months or four months or so after i got my bow and i killed uh, my first hog with a compound and i've been hooked since and you know people that do the traditional and like the recurve and stuff like that more power to them but the day that i picked up that compound i was in love and i haven't put it down since well see and that's and there's room hunting is so multifaceted i mean there's room for guys that want the newest and most technologically advanced thing there's stuff there for guys that are gearheads there's stuff for people that want to make things as difficult as humanly possible on themselves, you know, like what you're talking about. I mean, there are, there are guys, 
that are duck hunting with self-made bows and you know they're holding their their gnat arrowheads on with pine pitch or sinew and stuff i mean so there's this entire gamut that you can run and you can it you know depends on what you can afford what your interest level is how much time you have and people wax and wane in their lives you know guys that are 20 years old and single guy with no family he's got a little more room sometimes to go off the deep end in it and then as you get older you get a family you get responsibilities you know the lights have to stay on you might sure. turn into more of that kind of weekend warrior and you said man you know i want to maximize my opportunities in this situation because i don't get to hunt as much as i want to or i really really love shooting this particular uh this bow you know and you know with a compound bow you can shoot a hundred yards i don't know if you could do that ethically in a hunting situation but you can line up <laughs> you can line up a target you can shoot a hundred yards maybe someone's doing that traditional tackle i've never seen myself i haven't seen it either but that's the thing like even when i practice i don't know i'm such a stickler for like practicing situations like things that i know that i'm really going to do so i'll practice sitting down you know i'll practice in a stand and obviously you know the easiest way just to keep your form is just practicing you know flat footed or whatnot but most of my shots are like 20 to 30 yards i know guys you know like you said they go out and they shoot 100 yards and they're like oh well if you can shoot 100 then it's easier to shoot 20 my thing is if I get a repetition, you know, shooting 20, 30 yards, then when that time comes, whether it's a hog, a deer, a turkey, you know, any of those things that I like to go after with my bow, when the time comes, when the moment of truth comes, yeah, you got that repetition, you got that practice. So that's how I do it. But that's like you said, there's room for everything. To me, there's no definitive you absolutely have to do it this way. You know, you can only shoot a crossbow. You can only shoot a compound bow. Like there's no, you know, absolute. And that's what makes it beautiful. Yeah. And you know, there's a lot of that stuff is situation based as well. You know, so I live in central Arkansas and a Marlin 30-30, lever action 30-30. There's probably been more deer killed in the woods in Arkansas with that gun than any other, any other method. But you know, that's not like that kind of hunting that, uh, say, like a Stephen Rennell or something does out west, that's an ineffective tool for that. So you can't you can't be absolute with that if you're going to have varied experiences. So like I said, yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit with it. You know, there's a lot of stuff that I do that some people might consider extra work, but it's things that I enjoy. It gives me gives me a richer experience when I'm outside. So so that's what I do. You know, I've got a couple hard and fast rules that I follow. I live in a place where you can bait for deer and it's not really my, yep. uh, my cup of tea, but that's, I mean, absolutely. Most people kill deer, uh, either coming to a feeder or on their way to a feeder, you know, in a pine thicket in South Arkansas, that's where how a lot of hunting is done here. Mm -hmm. But like I said, that's awesome. And I enjoy eating the deer that my friends kill that way. Uh, <laughs> but you know, for myself, you know, I want, I want to try and find a trail from, you know, between a bedding area or something or uh, find a draw that I know they're running. And then depending on, you know, if it's the end of October when the deer start to rut around central Arkansas uh, yep. later in the year, you know, use different tactics. Uh, because I learned how to hunt bow hunting, I never really got that out of my head. So even when I hunt with a rifle, I basically bow hunt the deer with a rifle. So very few of the shots I've had at deer are past 20 yards. You know, almost gotcha. every year I've killed has been inside of 20 yards. But that's just, that's what specifically works for me and what I get the most out of. But yeah, I'm not taking anything away from anybody else's experience. Uh, like I said, that's one of the, that's one of the things that's awesome about, about hunting as an umbrella. So what you're saying is, is that you've never went to one of your buddy's house and because he shot his deer over corn or whatever bait of choice, you said, nope, I can't eat this because you shot it over corn. You're saying that you've never done that. No, absolutely not, man. I mean. Uh, I mean, if you're frying up, if you're frying up backstrap, then we're here to we're here to eat fried backstrap, you know. Uh, and it's, it's not that I haven't. When I when I first started hunting, I think the first year I, uh, you know, I had like a like one of those little uh, PVC pipe feeders that you you rig together with scrap material, and I absolutely killed. Yeah, you put it like on the tree yeah, yeah, or whatever. You know, bungee straps was real low fight, and yep. I absolutely killed a uh, I killed a yep. yearling coming to one of those it's just as i develop kind of developed an ethos you know that fit me and my personality and my situation i just kind of moved away from that a little bit but sure I mean, do what you got to do you know i mean it's it's legal i think it's actually pretty ethical there are some you know with the spread of cwd there are some concerns with it you know but i mean just be an intelligent informed yeah. member of society and you know, there's room for everybody well, that, and that's the thing. The reason why I said that, and I guess I was, you know, joking, but because I don't know about you, but for, you know, better or worse, I participate 
Um, and I use the word participate loosely. It's mostly like stalking mm -hmm. and reading in a lot of sure. Facebook groups. And I just sit back and laugh at a lot of the conversations and the hills that people are willing to die on. And it's, to me, it, it's funny because, you know, people, they get all up in arms about the baiting. They get all up in arms with the cross gun and the crossbow and all this other stuff. And the only thing I sit back and think about a lot of times is like, so you're at your buddy's house, you know, his wife or him or whatever. Y'all standing around, you know, the grill and you got some back straps going, you know, you got some chopped up venison, whatever the case is, or venison burgers or whatnot. And you're going to stop and say, hey. Did you shoot that over corn? Because if you did, I can't eat that. Like, nobody says that. So it's just like, why Why do people get so up in arms or so upset about it? Well, so, you know, but cause, cause, to each his own. Because people like to take the stance that the way that they do things is the only way to do stuff. And that that's not hunting. That's all sorts of stuff, you know. But, yeah, I mean, you know. Yes, I see that every day in yeah, the television and, industry. <laughs> in television business, everybody thinks their way is the only way to produce TV. So, yeah, no. Yeah, you I, know, I and totally man, you know, like, <laughs> there's an expression, you know, like the most dangerous phrase in the world is that's the way we've always done it. You know, there's things have to, <laughs> things have to be malleable. Yes, you know, the management uh, of these species, federally and state, it has to be malleable, and it does change according to the science and the data that they're able to collect, you know, the tracking collars and the bands and, and all that stuff. And they say, hey, we got to back off of this species. This species, we can make it more, we can have more liberal uh, seasons on. I mean, you know, in Arkansas, people are really lucky in Arkansas. If you live in Arkansas, I think it's like $65, say $72 or something like that if you're going to buy a trout stamp and uh, your duck stamps. But you get six deer tags. Mm -hmm. uh, you get two turkey tags. You can hunt black bears. You can put in the lottery to hunt an elk. You can put in the lottery to hunt a gator. You've got all the fur trapping you want, all the small game. You can fish some of the best trout st streams in America. You can fish for uh, paddle fish, alligator gar. I mean, any number of things for $60. And it's so liberal Jesus. because there's such a wealth of that natural resource because it's been managed intelligently and intentionally. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> no, you, I remember there was a big to do about like the different, the way that they were starting to do charges for like guys that come from out of state. Cause you know, I've been to Arkansas the last two years, duck hunting or whatever. And I'm just like, look, hey, you get the opportunity. Sure. It's more pricier than if you lived in the state. But I mean, hey, if you're coming in from out of town, pay your money, go have your fun and, and, and be done with it. Well, you know, and, and duck hunting. Duck hunting in Arkansas, it took me a while to really realize this, but Arkansas is, I would argue, the premier or one of the one of the premier locations for duck hunting on the planet. And it's because Arkansas has, and that place, Black Duck Revival, that I, I put together, it's located in the middle of this, but Arkansas has the largest block of contiguous, you know, green timber bottomland forest that floods up in the wintertime when you can hunt ducks. And mm -hmm. hunting ducks in timber is such an amazing experience. When it goes right, when you see them cup up and come down through those trees and they're knocking branches off, and I mean, maybe it's a little hole and they're having trouble getting in there, but they just want in so, so much because you did a lot of stuff right. You figured out where they were at. You figured out where they wanted to be. You figured out the water level. You did a good job calling or not calling as the situation dictated. You worked out the decoy. You were placed in the hole correctly and all that happens. That's my favorite thing in the whole world, you know, outside of experiences with my family. But when you think about getting to do that and the fact that I think it's like $250 for an out-of-state license, and I think that lets you, I think you can do five days. I think for every piece of public ground that you hunt, you got to pay like a negligible amount to hunt that spot. But, yep. you know, compare that to going elk hunting in Colorado or trying to go to Montana to hunt a moose or any of these kind of experiences. For a lot of people, people that live around Arkansas, they can maybe come through a lot. But there's people that coming to hunt green timber in Arkansas is a once or twice in a lifetime opportunity. And when you start looking at it like that, it's a few hundred dollars. That's not chump change. I understand that. But if you're going to make right. a week long trip, you know, you got a year to put a few dollars together because I promise you spend at least 350 on your waiters. If you're trying to be like your buddies and you're shooting a, a Browning or something, you got 13 or $1,500 and a gun, you know, you got money in decoys. I mean, you got money in it anyway. So. Exactly. Exactly. I hear you because, like I said, I made two trips. I made one last year and I made one earlier um, in January. 
and I love it. Like it's one of those things where I want to try to do at least once every year. I kind of look at it as like a cap off because I hunt when I'm up here for work. I hunt in Illinois and in Wisconsin and I goose hunt a lot in Illinois. And I mean, there's really not a lot of ducks. It's hit or miss the duck hunting in Illinois, but the goose hunting is on fire. You know, I'll go goose hunting maybe six, seven times, you know, during the season schedule permitting and whatnot. And then I look forward to my Arkansas trip as like a capper on my waterfowl season. So I like going, want to try, you know, some different places maybe next year if schedule permits. But yeah, there's nothing like to me, that's where you want to end it, end it at if you have the opportunity. And man, that's normal. You know, the end of our season, you know, at the end of January and normally, you know, the last three weeks or so seem to be some of the best. You know, the weather this year was insane, and, I mean, it's probably one of the worst duck seasons in living memory in Arkansas. But uh, I've heard a lot of people say that. That was kind of like the word in the waterfowl community this year. It's like the end of the season or – just Arkansas, hunting Arkansas period was probably one of the toughest, you know, depending on how long you've been doing it, is one of the toughest in memory. Oh, it was, I mean, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. You know, I was really, like, I was doubting myself. I'm like, what am I doing wrong until I start talking to other people, you know, in places that should have had hundreds of ducks, you know, clubs that normally have hundreds of ducks under their belt. By the beginning of January, you know, they're dealing with 12 ducks. It was just a fluke season. Just weird stuff happens, you know. I think people in Missouri did awesome this year, which is, yep. you know, I'm, yep. glad, I'm glad they had a good season. And, you know, there's there's probably going to be some talk about changing maybe some regulations. Waterfowl hunting is incredibly complex on some levels with the regulations. And like I said, in Arkansas, we're, we're pretty lucky because, you know, there's only one place in the whole state that's on a draw system. Everything else is first come, first serve. And, mm -hmm. you know, that, that did create a culture of the boat racing and the souping up. 25 horsepower motors and some kind of dangerous activities, <laughs> but right. they've kind of curbed that. There's times, you know, these big places, you know, like the famous Bayou Mita. I mean, that place is covered up with enforcement and they're going to make you, make you act right in there, you know? So, uh, but all this other, most of the stuff that I hunt, I'm not fighting a whole bunch of other people to hunt it. And that's awesome because it gives me time to really get into the woods and kind of start figuring them out. Sure. Uh, scouting. And then, you Doing know, your scouting. Yeah, scouting. And just and figuring out, you know, how the land, you know, for me, there's stuff that I duck hunt that I want information on it year round because, yeah, I want to know, you know, the topography of it and when it's going to flood up off coming off of this river or whatever. But then, you know, I want I want to know places where, hey, maybe there's some old swamp donkey hanging out down in there. And maybe by scouting for ducks, I can find a little find a little island or something out there that he's swimming 100 yards to. Or this could be really awesome squirrel hunting, all sorts of stuff. Uh I don't know. I kind of lost my train of thought there, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> just you, you can bounce all over the state. Right. Some places are better than others right. for specific things, but there's lots of different terrain here. And yeah, we had, we had a, a rough duck season, but I promise you in five years, you know, it'll just be a story that people tell, you know, maybe some things are changing. Maybe they need to change some regulations. Maybe some of the rest area stuff is, is being weird, but, uh, but I don't know. I feel like we can figure it out and, and Arkansas can stay just an unbelievable place to hunt ducks. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, you guys, it'll bounce back. You know, like you say, every year can't be on fire, just like sports. You know, some years you have like a down year or whatever, and then you just come on back and it'll be, it'll be just fine. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to going back down there next year. Um, and at some point, I'm probably going to give you a call and see what we can do if I can come down there, check your place out because. We can make it happen. Because this, the Black Duck Revival, let's talk about that. Now, where, how did you get the vision to start that? Like, what, what made you want to start that? Because you just got in, you know, you started hunting, you know, like you said, about nine years ago or whatever. And, you know, you fell in love with it. You're doing it. But that's a, a big, courageous jump to go from, okay, I'm just hunting and enjoying this to like, okay, let's do this. And I want to start a lodge and make a business out of it. Talk to me about that. Man, well, I guess a couple of years ago, I was, uh, I was just over there. Uh, Black Duck Revival is located in a, a town called Brinkley, which is pretty much the halfway point between Memphis and Little Rock. Uh, it's right there in the heart of the Arkansas Delta. And I'd just been doing a lot of hunting up there, you know, for three or four years. And I said, man, I wonder if I could just find it's the Delta in, you know, in the South. So you're talking about a place that has economically has 
been on a decline probably for 50 or 60 years with the way that agriculture has changed. So I felt like I could probably find a, just a little shotgun house or something that I could get for a reasonable amount of money and just, you know, just a place where I didn't have to drive an hour and 15 minutes every time I wanted to go duck hunting. I came across this place and at first it seemed like it wasn't going to work out and, you know, just a few months down the line it worked out. It just, and every time I peeled a layer back, I was like, wow, this is, you know, this is a place that's been in use for, you know, 80 to 100 years, something like that. Just patch job after patch job. So it just so happens to be. The, the building itself is over 82 to 100 years old? Yeah, you know, it's such a weird deal. I can't track down exactly how old it is. There was a, a terrible, there's been floods and there's been fires that have ravaged that area and a lot of records were lost but okay but yeah i mean as far back as i can figure out just with you know older people living in the community you know it was a church for a really long time up till about three years ago uh it's been a home it's been a corner store back in the 50s it was a church in the 60s and then converted again so it's got this long storied history and i was just peeling the layers back on it literally i said man you know if i'm going to do this i'm just going to need to fix it up right so i just kind of make the jump and the idea kind of developed from that you know i was really focused on making a place that was specific to its intent, which was I wanted it to be a place that different people with different experience levels or different interest levels could all be there together. They could experience the wealth that was right around there in Brinkley. I mean, there's, if you drive 30 minutes anywhere from around Black Duck Revival, you can be in some of the best duck hunting, deer hunting, turkey hunting, bear hunting, you know, in the country. So, and those are all public lands or are those like private lands that you have or like what no, that, are those? that's public land stuff. I, okay. I'm a public I'm a public land hunter. It doesn't mean I don't occasionally hunt on some private land, but 90 percent of the hunting I do is on public land because in Arkansas, it's such a resource. It's like a lot of these, uh, as I understand, a lot of these Western states where so much of it is public and you have so much access to that. So uh, I wanted to make a place, you know, that was that anyone could feel comfortable. You know, if you wanted to come with your kids and your wife, maybe your wife wasn't interested in hunting, but she just wanted a comfortable place where she could she could relax for the weekend while you were out with the kids hunting. Uh, mm. Or if you've got, you know, some a group of guys that have been hunting together for 15 years and they just love coming together from all over the country and getting their week of hunting in. Or, you know, if you're a non-traditional hunter, that's a real big focus of mine is people that didn't have that access earlier in life because hunting is definitely something where you've got to have some sort of community around you. Someone's got to introduce you to it. And then, you know, as you get into more marginalized communities, there's, there's these added barriers to entry. So, you know, I actually stayed at a duck lodge one time a couple years ago and, uh, it was a work kind of thing. So I guess I felt like I didn't have as much uh, say so in it. But, you know, this place, this place had a, uh, like a Sambo statue out on the front porch, uh, big red mm-hmm. lips eating a slice of watermelon, you know, and just, that immediately is going to make a lot of people uncomfortable, you know? And uh, yeah, definitely. And so I wanted, I wanted to have a place that was, that anyone could be at and feel like it was a place for them, that it was welcoming. And that also was a good place that gave them ready access to the outdoors. And, you know, with it being in Brinkley, in town, I mean, you've got all your city services around it. It's right off the highway, you know, so as soon as you get off Highway 40, you're a mile from it. It's just easy to get to. It's easy to get to the places you want to be from there. And it's, you know, it's got a big open floor plan. I used a bunch of the old wood, reused it and framed up walls and stuff with it and left that exposed. My intention was just to make a very comfortable, welcoming place where people could get the most out of the outdoors. And then you did all the work yourself or you and a couple of buddies like you you took on this renovation job like completely pretty much on your own right yeah i mean it ended up being a total gut job so i mean the floor joists had to come out the the walls had to all come down low bearing walls i had to had to uh you know support those and remove them and put new stuff in and it uh I definitely had some friends that helped me out. I farmed out. It needed an entire rewire, so I farmed out the electrical, I farmed out the new plumbing, and I farmed out the HVAC system. Mm-hmm. But everything else, framing it up, putting the floors in, you know, sheetrock, painting, putting new ceiling in some of the stuff, just all of that stuff, just kind of did on my own, uh, like I said, with some help from a couple of friends. And, man, you know, if you're willing to work and – you got YouTube, you can figure a lot of stuff out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We definitely live in a YouTube, a YouTube age. You can just go in there and just put it in and kind of go through step by step how to do things. Yeah. So 
I mean, you know, hanging sheetrock, I had done a little bit of that before, but I didn't really have a lot of experience in finishing it, you know, so stuff like that. And, and you know, things probably took about twice as long as they would have if I had known what I was doing from the start. But it ended up coming out pretty good, and uh, I was able to get it open before duck season started. You know, I had a pretty decent first year uh, with very little mm -hmm. advertising. And now this next year, I'm going to look into uh, having some fields where, you know, if you want to come, do some self-guided stuff. You got your buddies. You just want a one-stop shop where you got a great place to stay. You can park your four-wheelers, whatever you want, in the backyard, all fenced in and locked. And then I've got a place for you to go, you know, with a pit for five or six guys. Just kind of keep it a little more self-contained. And mm -hmm. also, I'm kind of giving myself the goal of doing four classes up there this year and doing four dinners up there and just kind of I've got this place now, so I'm going to try and use it for the things that interest me, you know, and that I think I can be of most use to other people with. Sure. So kind of like, you know, like a banquet hall. And then you said the classes, what kind of classes are you teaching? Like gun safety or duck hunting classes? What kind of classes are you thinking about? Well, you know, a lot of my background is in cooking. And, and one of the things that really locked me into hunting was uh, this desire to work with wild game. And, you know, that entire process, you know, you hear about it, that, you know, the field, field to the fork or whatever. But, you know, I'm interested in teaching some butchery classes, some charcuterie classes. You know, how can you take that, that wild hog that you got or this limited ducks? or some of this deer and turn it into some really beautiful uh, charcuterie, you know, even stuff just like bratwurst and bologna, things like that that you can make yourself. And I'd like to, I'd like to have a couple speakers come in, some people that can share some experiences with some folks. And like we said, get some of that representation out there. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, cause I know, I know a lot of people, you know, African Americans that are, they're intimidated by the idea of hunting. They're interested in it, but the, the South has a very complicated history and still living in an age where there, there's a living memory of violence done to black people in the woods of the South. So right. that's an extra hurdle that you kind of got to help get people over. And I think the way to do that is to bring them in and involve them and say, look, there's been since the start of this country, there's been people that look like you and me out here hunting and fishing and providing for themselves and for their families. You know, really until the beginning of the 1900s, hunting was still a, it was a subsistence it was, a, it was a method of subsistence living. And then there was a switch to kind of like with the Eddie Bowers and stuff coming out to where it became more of a sporting activity for the elite. And I think that marginalized some people. But, you know, in the South, you know, we've got a great tradition of black houndsmen, guys that run dogs for everything from deer to squirrels to raccoons to possums. Uh, right. rabbit dogging a lot of black fishermen you know there's there's like black bass fishing clubs and stuff here in little rock and not you know not just focusing on african americans you know but women just people that grew up in the city didn't have any exposure to it you know most people get into hunting and fishing from their dads and their grandpas and stuff like that and you might have been in a situation where you just didn't have that and so if you're interested in it, I want to have a place where you can come and you can learn about how you deal with that animal once you get it. You can talk to some people that have more experience in the realm than you do. And then you can learn about what to do with that meat and that protein once you once you get it and have it all broken down. Yeah, so you can be able to process it and take care of it on your own. But it's funny, like I was just sitting here listening to you and I think about some of my own experiences. You know, when I got into it, you know, I grew up on a dirt road. So I grew up in the country. Like I said, I didn't do a lot of hunting, did some fishing, but it's so funny now just like talking to different people they're like man you out in the woods like that and you know you out there you're not worried about somebody coming up on you you're not worried about you know this that and the other and it's it's just all about stigmatism and like you know your perception and the more that you can put out there like okay hey first of all this is nothing new you know this has been going on you know longer than any of us have been here and just changing that perception changing that stigmatism it's like you know i, I came across a couple of people and it's so funny like to read the hashtags it's like we do this too oh, and really? it's like yeah like it <laughs> it's been around like it's not new it's new be just, it may be new to somebody that doesn't see it or you know you didn't just know because you were living like in your feet of space or whatever which is perfectly fine but it's like yeah this is this is nothing new this is not like something that just started like oh this is a new trend or whatever no it's it's, it's been around you know for some people it's a lifestyle i'll tell people in a minute for me it's more of a release a hobby a sport you know that i enjoy but for some people yeah it's their way of life they eat breathe sleep 365 the only way they eat is they go out and hunt people that i know they're like that 
you know, for me, it's a little bit more fun. I enjoy, it. you know, and introduce my son to it. I tried to introduce my daughter to it. She don't care for it too much. She loves the food. She, I've never seen her, you know, shy away when I finish cooking. But like you said, it's, it's all about representation and there's a place for everybody from all walks of life. And no matter what your experience level, your background or whatever, I think that's what a lot of people don't really understand. This is one of the sports or types of activities that it can include anybody and everybody well you know and man i'd say i would really argue that it's something that is central to the human experience you know when you when you exert the effort to you know learn a piece of land figure out what the animals are doing you're able to put yourself in a situation where you're able to harvest that animal that you're going after and then you take the responsibility of breasting it or plucking it or, or processing it or whatever you went out into the world you procured food in one of the most rudimentary ways possible, and then you brought it back, and you're feeding yourself and your family. You've gotten exercise. You've, you know, probably improved your mood because you've been exposed to sunlight and the outside, you know, and, like, even getting into scientific stuff, you know. Our body processes natural sunlight in a different and more efficient way than it does artificial light. All that stuff, you've traversed that chain, and you end up with that result of Something as simple as duck poppers or fried backstrap and mashed potatoes and gravy, which I'm not talking down on. They're simple, but I love both of them. You know, there's a sense of accomplishment and a sense of humanity to that, really. That's kind of what I want to get across to people is, you know, I love duck hunting. I understand that there's a lot of barriers to entry uh, for a lot of people to hunt ducks. But it doesn't have to be hunting ducks. It can be fishing brim. It can be hunting squirrels. You know, it can be trapping. Uh, I've done a little bit of that, and the woodsmanship skills that you need to be an effective trapper are amazing. It can be hunting deer, you know, and it, it might be western hunting. It might be elk. It might be black bear. Whatever it might be, there's a place for you in it, and you're only going to be better and richer for it. You're never going to engage in it, whether you're successful or unsuccessful in it, and feel like you didn't get anything positive out of that experience. Wow. Now that is a very unique take on it. Cause I never really, I never really sat back and thought about it from that standpoint, but yeah, you you make a very good point. I mean, when you, when you go out and go goose hunting with your buddies and you bring that home and you cook it up for your family, you know, and your kids are eating it and your wife's eating it. I mean, don't you feel proud that you were able to bring that home and provide that for your family? Yeah, there is a sense of, I think for me, it's more so with the deer because like this year I took, you know, my first deer on my own personal property. Wow. And that was definitely a sense of accomplishment because, you know, I've had that property going on for about three years. And this past season was the first year that I actually made it a point that, okay, I'm going to take the time and I'm going to hunt it harder. I'm going to hunt it more. Like I'm going to spend, you know, more opportunities hunting my own property instead of, you know, taking trips or whatever to different places to go and hunt. I was like, okay, I'm going to put in the time. I put in the invest. I'm actually going to go down there and I'm going to hunt. Took my first doe. There was a, you know, sense of accomplishment. There was a sense of accomplishment of getting close and getting, you know, even though I didn't get the opportunity to pull the string back, I had a a very good sized buck on my property patterned pretty good. And I only missed him by a matter of minutes. So for me personally, being able, like you said, to learn the land and, and get the patterns and understand what's going on out there. That's more so the sense of accomplishment for me. Yeah. I mean, because you're using, I'm not trying to be too up in the, in the clouds about this, but I mean, you're using things that are inherent to being a human being, even though it's in a different place and you've got some different methods, you know, at the root of it, you're using the same bits and pieces of yourself that, you know, someone thousands of years ago was using to try and get on that deer. And then you put it all together and it worked out for you. You know, I find a lot of a sense of accomplishment and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I might romanticize it too much, but I mean, <laughs> The guy that kind of introduced me to the woods, he said, every time you go hunting, you'll always see something new. Now, you have to be you have to be aware of that because, you know, in the beginning, it'll be, oh, that's my first buck. That's my first group of deer. That's the first time I saw this animal. And then as you get more familiar with it, it'll be, man, I've never seen a barn owl out here at this hour. Or, you know, you start noticing a specific, some specific uh, attribute of a plant that you'd walk by a hundred times and never noticed. It'll always, it might be little things, but you'll always see something new, which means that you're always growing every time you go out there and do it. Even if it's not a long hunt, it doesn't have to be some giant backpacking trip. Just getting out there, getting outside you know, testing yourself a little bit and seeing what you can come up with. I mean, it's always good to me. Yeah. 
No, definitely. Because even like walking around on my property, you know, I felt like, you know, I got a pretty good handle of okay, where this is, where that is and stuff. But now it's gotten to the point where it's like, wait a minute, that wasn't here. Wait a minute. Was that always here? Did I just not pay attention to it? And then, you know what I'm saying? You start finding other little things and signs and, you know, just like, oh, okay. So this is trails that they're taking or like, oh, wow, this roost wasn't here. Okay. Somebody, you know, another bird or whatever's come in and started roosting here. Okay. I must be doing something right, you know, with the plots or I must be doing something right with the feeding pattern, you know, and you start seeing more animals on camera. Same thing. Like you were just talking about trapping. It's funny. That's something that I'm going to start experimenting with over the summer because I'm sick of seeing raccoons at night around my feeders like yeah. it's like look boys these ain't for y'all this is for my deer and the turkeys you know you guys are kind of messing up the program here so that's something you know something else i've started to, to kind of look at i mean yeah there are people that have it's passed down generation generation and all that kind of stuff and you may have like a grandpa or somebody to teach you but for somebody like us it's like hey you know, i'm going to start you know I'm talk to a couple people start looking at some videos start kind of trying to figure it out and i'm gonna get out there and set a couple of traps well, man, and I'll tell you something about that as far as, you know, having that, that familial narrative and then some people not. You know, there's a very, and it's kind of dying out now as the older people are dying out, but uh, there's a, a traditional black southern holiday meal of roasted raccoon and sweet potatoes, right? And that, that takes its origins from there were some people that while in bondage, they were allowed to uh, hunt and trap at night after they had done, you know, the work during the day to supplement theirs and their family's diets. So if you're out there doing that at night, out there in the woods in the South, you're going to come across possum and coons. So this became like a, like a treasured addition to their diet. So when you go out there this year and you trap some coons, and I'm not saying you might not eat them, but you trap these coons, you're actually participating in something that's been going on for hundreds of years, you know, with people that look like you or have shared experiences as people in your family and all that kind of stuff. So even though you didn't grow up doing it, when you do enter it, you're participating, you're becoming part of a much longer narrative. And I think that's, right. I think that's really, really neat. Well, it's like an extension. And it's funny because I was talking one day, I was having a conversation with one of my cousins and you know, it was a few years after I started hunting and started bow hunting and stuff like that. And I never met my grandfather. My grandfather passed away, uh, both of them passed away um before i was born but i remember he was talking about uh my grandfather he said you know he would take his shotgun and his dog and load it up on the back of the truck and it's like every time my grandmama would piss him off or start getting on his nerves he grabbed that old shotgun and he grabbed that you know hit tap the back of the tailgate and that dog would jump in and he'd go out in the woods and just go hunting for whatever he could find and listening to him tell that story it was just like well dang that's not too far of an extension like you always wonder sometimes if it is just as simple as like okay this is something i want to do or is it an instinct that you didn't even know about that finally just came to the surface like it's always been there but it just started surfacing yeah i mean i definitely think that's what happened with me you know i grew up my dad loved watching old westerns and i would always watch those old westerns and read uh, louis lamore books and stuff and i was always kind of drawn to it and when i started hunting i i realized what aspect of it i was drawn to i think ultimately what it comes down to is if you take everything away like the american dream is really about uh self-sufficiency right you know freedom of speech mm -hmm. freedom to assemble the idea that you can possibly you can work hard and put your head down you can make a million dollars this is all about the idea of self-sufficiency you know when you boil it down there's there's very little that's more self-sufficient than going into the outside world and outsmarting an animal whose entire job is to stay alive in a world like a prey animal, like a deer, where they've got natural predators. And you outsmart them and you're able to turn that animal from a sentient being into sustenance for yourself. To me, that's the ultimate form of self-sustainability. And I mean, frankly, I've had tight financial spots where hunting and the ability to hunt and have that meat in the freezer like made a difference in the quality of our lives that I, I wasn't able to make up with in finances at the time. So, I mean, I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about kind of heady, noble things, but I do really believe that there's, there's some real uh, nobility in this whole endeavor. You know, and like I said, there's so many different ways to do it that you can find the niche that fits you. And, it, you know, it can be, like I said, bow hunting, trying to bow hunt uh, ducks. 
uh, with some self-made bow. You know, you might just really love hanging out at a deer camp and going squirrel hunting and riding around on four wheelers and stuff like that. And I would still say that participating in that is 10,000 times better than, you know, sitting on your phone playing Candy Crush for eight hours. <laughs> I cannot argue with that. Now, at your place down there, how's the hogs down there? Like, if you oh, that they're around Brinkley, is that pretty? Well, pretty man, good? hogs yeah. are hogs are everywhere in Arkansas. Uh, they've done some weird stuff with the regulations where, up till a few years ago, you could hunt hogs on public ground, and they've pretty much done away with that because, as far as the game and fish was concerned, they were having a problem with people catching hogs, taking a chunk out of their ear, marking them, or and letting them go or moving hogs around so they had places to hunt them. So mm -hmm. where Black Duck Revival is located is not going to be the greatest place for you to hog hunt. And, you know, that's honestly, that's something I've never done. All the hogs that I've ever gotten a hold of have been stuff that my buddies have killed down in South Arkansas, down in those pine thickets. I mean, yep. but, I mean, just as far as the state of Arkansas, you could probably kill all the hogs you wanted to. Right there, specifically in Brinkley, I would probably say that's not the, that's not the best place to start off. Gotcha. Gotcha. You going to get out there and try it. Now, I heard you say that your turkey population is not the best, but are you going to try to do turkey hunting around that uh, around that spot? Yeah, I'm going to do, I need to get out and do some looking and kind of, you know, it's a new deal where I've got a basis of understanding how it works, but I haven't gone off the deep end in turkey hunting yet. Yeah. I'm not sure what's going on with the turkey population in Arkansas because every state around us, you know, Missouri, Tennessee, Texas, Mississippi, Oklahoma, have tremendous turkey populations. I've heard a lot of different things. They've taken it down that it's just a spring season. There's not a fall season anymore. But I do know that the guys that I know that are about hunting turkeys, they kill turkeys every year. So it definitely can be done. And, you know, I'm looking for a reason to be in the woods during that time of year. Because squirrel fish sure. is shut down. You know, it's getting right there on the line to where the mosquitoes will pick you up and carry you off to the next state. So <laughs> it's kind of that, that way to extend some hunting season. And like I said, everyone I know who's ever killed a goblin tom says it's the most, you know, heart pounding and exciting and just coolest experience ever. So I need me some of that if I can get it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is. I went through that last year. I killed my first turkey. It was a Nebraska Miriam, and I shot him with my bow. And that's probably, other than, like I said, finally getting a deer from my own land, that is probably like the next on the list of my accomplishments in my hunting career. Just calling them in and listening to the gobbles and, and just working them, you know, into the, into the decoys and whatnot. Yeah that it's definitely an experience it, once you get to uh once you go down that road man it's hard to look back and man, you know and i've got a i've got a a little girl coming right in the middle of turkey season so i might be getting myself in trouble but man that's the awesome thing about <laughs> that's the awesome thing about hunting birds is you have to be so involved in it. like you said you're calling that animal in you're convincing that animal that you're one of them and uh right i mean i i just think that i feel like it's such an accomplishment and it's such an example of you know outdoorsmanship or woodsmanship you've taken the time and you've given that animal the respect by learning learning it well enough to convince it that you're one of them and the fact that they respond to you that was the thing it was just like especially with turkeys you know you can call ducks or whatever and you know you know you've done something right if they come into the spread or whatnot but like with turkeys like you're literally having a conversation with them like you hit that call just right and those hens they'll cluck back at you and then you hit that call just right again and that gobbler hits that gobble based off of your call going back and forth a few times man there oh my god there's nothing like it Man, that's, that's awesome. How did you do that? Were you like sitting out in the open? Were you in a blind? How did that whole thing work? I was in a blind. I was in a blind. We had, and it was in May. So it was kind of like towards the end of the season out there. But, um, we put out a laying hen decoy and I had hens kind of like passing through, you know, in the first hour or so. And then like the last. I was got quiet for a little bit, and then that last hour kept hitting a call. Like I had a little uh, push pull box call, and then I had a mouth call, diaphragm call in my mouth, and I just did a combination of making the calls with my mouth, and then hitting, you know, the push pull call, and then when I just thought like there was nothing going on, I and I was like, oh my god, and then I did it again. And it, it, it responded and I kept hearing them and I couldn't really tell how close they were. And I just peeked out of the side of the blind and it was four of wow. them. 
and they were just doing their business coming to the decoy and I had my camera going so I'm getting them as they're coming down and I got a great shot of all four of them and then they kind of start going out of frame and then it's just like all right I got to close the deal because they're going to you know if there's no more calling and they see this hen laying here but they really weren't intrigued on checking out the laying hen I think they were just kind of following the sounds mm -hmm. and once the sound stopped they were just kind of like okay well what's going on here so that was when I drew my bow back and I put my pin on uh on that wing joint and I popped him probably like 15 yards arrow passed through and then he kind of hobbled off and then he tried to fly and then as soon as he took off he probably went about 30 feet and then just plowed up right up under a tree wow so it, it was one of the yeah it was one of the most exciting things I can say I've ever done I was just like man man I mean that's that sounds like the perfect yeah, it, 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 you know, you get it with a bow too. Yeah, it was definitely, it's one of those things. Like, you know, I went out to Nebraska to go and film some stuff. And then the guy was like, okay, you can, um, you know, you can do some hunting as well. And it was just like, cool. And, you know, he put me in a great spot and he was just like, you know, with Miriam's just call. He was like, keep calling every 15 minutes. Just keep calling. It's like, you know, eventually they will, they'll respond. And I kept hitting that call every 15 minutes. And sure enough, in that last hour, Hour, these birds came down and i was just like holy smokes and like i said getting them on camera and just seeing the colors and seeing how bright you know the blood vessels and stuff fill up when they get ready to gobble and you know they puff up and stuff when they start to strut man it yeah it's one of those things that i'll never forget are you gonna continue with it and try and like get a, a grand slam or anything like that oh yeah yeah that's my plan hopefully if I get to the point where I can kind of dial back and kind of retire, then I'm definitely going to try a grand slam in one season. But yeah, this year I'm going to try hunting more. So again, on my property, trying to get the uh, Easterns to see if I can get them to cooperate. I haven't seen uh, as many as I would like to, which is more the reason why I need to start trapping some of these coons and possums and stuff. But yeah, that's my plan is to go through and, you know, Eastern and then, you know, Osceola and Miriam and then the Rio. So yeah, eventually I do want to get the Grand Slam. Man, that'd be awesome. You know, and those coons and those possums, man, as I understand it, they're hell on like turkey nests. Like, that's really what they're doing is they're yeah. getting those eggs before they can hatch. And that can have a, you know, back in the 70s, there was a boom in uh, fur trapping because the prices were so high. And that kind of helped ke keep some of those, those small mammalian predators under control. But now, I mean, no one, I think like a southern coon hide is worth like $2. Like, very few people are going to go through the effort of skinning and stretching and all that stuff. So, yeah, right. man, I think. Tanning, but yeah. I think that's awesome, man. You've got your own piece of property that you can kind of develop and shape for your purposes and i mean if you're out there feeding deer and turkey and trapping some of those predators the deer and the turkey they're getting the better end of it you know if you take a few of them off every year that's a pretty good trade for them oh yeah definitely definitely no because they they do like a you know like you said they tear up nest and then you know if the hens decide like look you know i'm going to defend this thing till you die or whatever that's basically what ends up happening is if the if the hens don't give it up pretty quickly they'll kill them and then still eat the egg so now you lost a hen and you've lost you know whatever the amount of the hatch that she had so yeah i got to get after them and get them out of there because like i said when i first bought that property you could see and hear turkeys all the time especially in the spring um and then there's no fall season in georgia and what i've found the last year or so i've seen them hitting the food plots pretty hard like as it gets close to winter like after that yeah. first frost or whatever they'll be out there in the field hitting those food plots pretty hard and then after that i think they just kind of like stick to the woods or either they go over to the neighboring property i'm not sure exactly what's going on but i'm gonna get out there in a few weeks and kind of do some scouting see if i can see if they're roosting anywhere around and just see if i can get out there and make it happen man well i hope it works out for you man that sounds awesome no, I appreciate it. I'm going a, I'm to a definitely try to get it done. We're going to put a bow on this little deal right here that we're doing. I've definitely enjoyed talking to you. But before we get out of here, I want you to let the people know where they can find you, like all your social media and then the name of the um of the lodge and everything like that. Tell the folks where they can find you. Uh, sure. So uh, you can go to the website. That's uh, just blackduckrevival.com. Uh, or you can find me on Instagram at uh, blackduckrevival on there too i think now that duck season's over i'm gonna focus a little bit more on creating a little bit of content and just having some more interesting stuff for for people to look at maybe do some you know short little kind of instructional videos and yeah i'm trying to get these fields locked up 
so uh, this next season we got will be a one stop shop if you want to come to Arkansas and and, uh, and hunt ducks. Well, I can tell you right now, it's definitely on my list. Um, as soon as I get my schedule and stuff, I'm going to try to plot out three, four days where I can come down there and just kind of shoot it with you and check your place out and, and then see if I can get on some of them ducks down in the timber. Yeah, man, we'll make it, we'll make it happen. I'm actually, I'm in the market for a new boat. I busted mine up pretty good this year. So we'll try and get a little bit bigger one. And, uh, yeah, getting that timber, like I said, man, anytime you can put people on those ducks in the timber, I mean, it's almost a religious experience. <laughs> so I look forward to it, man. I hope you can get down there and we can get on some of them birds in those, uh, in that green timber. Sounds good. And then we'll get you back on the podcast here, maybe after turkey season or even um, definitely before duck season starts. But maybe like over the summer, you can just kind of give us an update on how things are going down there. Yeah, I'd love to, man. I really appreciate it. I love what you're doing with this thing. So keep it up. Awesome. Jonathan, I really appreciate it, man. And I'll be talking to you. All right, brother. Be good. All right. This close is going to be really short here because we took so much time on the front end with the intro and Jonathan's interview was so freaking awesome. I'm just going to put it to you like this. Make sure you're following at official Bryantland on Instagram at three Bryantland on Twitter, Bryantland on Facebook. And if you got a comment, you got a question, you got some feedback, make sure you send us an email. AB3 Bryantland at gmail.com. Make sure you leave us a five star rating on iTunes. Drop us some comments, some feedback. Make sure you're checking out the website, www.bryantlandcountry.com. Pick you up some Bryantland merch. I'm going to get on out of here and start enjoying the break. You guys take it easy and we'll catch you next time on another episode of the Bryantland Country Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Bryant Land Country Podcast, hosted by AB3. Please leave us a positive review and five-star rating on iTunes. Be sure to check out our podcast section on our website, bryantlandcountry.com, for previous podcasts. Check us out on Instagram at official Bryant Land and Twitter at 3 Bryant Land. This has been an AB3 Media Production. Join us next time for another edition of the Bryant Land Country Podcast.